everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and today we are going to play with some of Wool to Die For's Zebra Fingering Weight Yarn. This yarn is 100% Peruvian Highland wool, and it is really, as you can see, unique. This two-ply yarn has one strand that is all sort of like a bare white color, and then another strand that is black or charcoal gray. And this is in a more variegated type pattern, and it is super, super fun and gives this really cool element to whatever you create already. Since this yarn is non-superwash, colors strike to it pretty slowly. Um, and so already when we add them, we get a bit of spread and a bit of a watercolor type feel. And I want to lean into this and layer on different colors of acid dye to have small shifting patches of color that might be a little subtle or maybe we'll decide to be a little less subtle and see where we end up. Before we go talk about the colors, I would like to give a huge shout out and thank you to my lab partner today, Micah. Micah, thank you so much for being my lab partner and I really hope you are gonna love the yarn that I create. If you at home would like to learn more about how you can become a lab partner, go and check out the listings in the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop. There will be a link down in the video description, along with links to the other tools and equipments that I use in my videos. I am going to pre-soak this yarn in some plain tap water for probably about 20 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, I do want the fibers to be well saturated so that way the dye can soak in. Now, as I mentioned, this yarn does absorb color fairly slowly. And sometimes when I've dyed uh, this colorway, I haven't been able to flip it <laughs> until I've let the pan cool off completely because it just takes a little bit longer to absorb colors. So we'll see if we can mitigate this a bit by adding a lot of acid today, but I'm very curious to see how these liquid dyes will perform on this base. I pulled a lot of blue 1% stock solutions that I have in Dark Navy, Sea Spray, which has a bit of green to it, Baby Blue Eyes, Sappho Air Blue, and then Indigo Blue. And a lot of these colors have very subtle differences to them already. But if I want to help shift things a little bit more, I have some stocks of Radioactive and Flamingo Pink, which can help us shift some of these blues a little bit more teal or a little bit more purple uh, if we feel the need for that. And so these are the colors that I am going to focus on today. I know it's a lot of colors, but this kind of technique is fun to do with a lot of different colors as we layer them over and over one another onto the yarn. I wanted to quickly show off that our pre-soak water is a little bit cloudy. There's something that is definitely coming out um, and that probably doesn't affect our ability to dye the yarn. I don't usually scour my yarn, which means I don't usually wash it with soap to try to remove dirt and oils, uh, but maybe that's something I should do in the future. Do you think I should try that? <laughs> Let me know down in the comments. Because of the cloudiness, I decided to add some fresh liquid to our dye bath. I'm currently adding six cups of tap water that has six tablespoons of white vinegar in it. This is a lot of acid, which may cause some things to strike a little bit faster, which is totally fine with me. Um, so we are in a nice, uh, not the lowest possible immersion, but fairly low immersion. And so I'm gonna start heating this up on medium heat, we're on two burners. All of the tools and equipment I am using are dedicated for dyeing yarn and aren't used for the preparation of food. And once this heats up, we're gonna start coming over to add our color. Micah, I hope you're really excited. We're not hot yet, but I thought that it would be helpful for myself to come and take a look at the different colors that we are playing with today. So we've got dark navy, indigo, 
which is, huh, so dark navy does tend to look purple until heat. Indigo feels less purple than navy to me. These all started out, and this is sapphire blue, which may be, which may be clogged. Sapphire blue is a hard one to get to dissolve. It tends to get chunks in it. Uh, and so therefore the squeeze bottle isn't working well, so I'm gonna use this little pipette. Now one thing I'm not doing here today um, is I am not pressing to help move these colors around. And the main reason for that is that this is non-superwash yarn. The colors will likely spread out a fair amount on their own. So this is Baby Blue Eyes, which isn't, the squeeze bottle isn't working super well. I'm gonna need to get a paper clip. Um, Baby Blue Eyes is a nice, fairly bright blue once you build it up, but you can see from when I was adding it in the 1% stock, it is way less concentrated than a lot of these other colors. Okay, here is some sea spray which is the most teal, and also will likely need a little poke with a paper clip. Um, because these bottles often get so heavy, I don't often use them to squeeze in. I could snip more of the tip if I wanted liquid to come out faster. But we already have like a real range of colors here in the blues. Oh, I'm gonna reduce the heat to low. Um, but I do think that we might use a little bit of some radioactive and a little bit of some flamingo pink. Not necessarily like on their own, although that's very, very watermelony and pretty, but layered with the blues, which may spread more and more, would be really, really awesome. And so this isn't something I am going to label. I just wanted to show uh, in a more concrete way, the range of colors that we are gonna be layering today. And I think, hmm, I think that what I'm going to do next is we're gonna let this sit for five minutes, and then we're gonna come and try to move the dye on here a little bit, but also flip the yarn, because this will tell me how much these colors are really sinking through, so then I get a feel early on for how much color and stuff I will need to use for this. My goal now, okay, that pink looks pretty well set. There's a hint of some yellow. Okay, the sapphire blue, that one, um, because it wasn't all dissolved, but I don't mind if that spreads further, so that one didn't all go. The indigo is doing well, and the navy, is doing well at also. So that is a good sign. I am not super concerned about the sapphire lingering. I think that it's going to probably need more exposure to water and it's spreading more is part of what we are going to want for our watercolory feel. But now let's flip this. And actually there was not, oh, I should grab some tongs. But as I picked this up, there wasn't that much color that moved. Um, and so that is good. Now, the lines that we added on the top were relatively sharp uh, with their color placement. But if we now look towards this side, you can see that we have spread. And this is part of what we'll add to that watercolor Feel. Even without us attempting to spread out the colors. And I'm starting here again with some pink. I'm going to come in at a little bit more of a diagonal here as well. Even though maybe I don't really want to layer the pink and the green, even though I just did. Um, and we can also do some random little spots of it. Um, but most of the color that I will be adding on is going to be blue. Um, some of this green and pink is just gonna be a little bit more randomly, randomly placed through here to add a little more dimension to these blues that we are gonna add that are all so similar. Now, I did receive some questions recently about why I like to go diagonal, and the big reason is to try to 
reduce regularity and pooling. Now, as I go across like this, the yarn is scrunched up, so that does add some elements of randomness to it. Uh, but I do like to go at angles because that helps me start randomly placing the colors. Oh, and this is continuing to go. <laughs> this helps me randomly add our colors on in a way that feels fun. But we're not just doing lines, I'm doing dots and things as well. Uh, indigo is not a color that I have played with a ton yet. And this, oof, this one is squeezing up super well. It's not a color I've used much at all. It's not, in the indigo isn't a color I've played with very much, but it might be a better navy than dark navy. That is something that w will warrant some more consideration. And yeah, some of these I may have to swap from using these squeeze bottles. Uh, which again, I use more as storage bottles. Um, but sometimes, I guess a thing to keep in mind is as we reach the bottom of a stock solution, that is the point where uh, as, as you get to the bottom, there could be the dregs, there could be some powders in there. And so that is always something to keep in mind. But, oh, <laughs> and it's keeping on going. But the thing with adding color randomly is that, you know, I'm going to let it go until it stabilizes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes as you approach the end of a color, then you start uh, to have more, uh, what was I going to say? You start to have more powder. Sometimes it can get a little more concentrated towards the bottom. But my indigo stock is one of the ones I have the most of right now. So I know this looks a little bit like a hot mess, but I don't know, I'm excited and I'm enjoying, actually on camera, I feel like you can feel more of the dimension in here. One thing I am not sure about at all is how much of the uh, zebra stripe will remain from this. And that's something that I really hope we keep a lot of it, but you know, it's hard to say for sure. All of these colors that I'm using today are these pre-mixed colors, but you don't have to do things that way. You could mix up using say two colors, using like some bits of yellow, um, or red mix up a lot of these blues. Uh, so you do not have to, and actually I'm gonna you put this in a cup. I'm gonna use the mini pipette for this. And with the sea spray, I'm coming in and I'm going more specifically for some of these more white areas. I'm still planning to add and layer color on the other side eventually. I would like to cover up all of the white, um, but it's okay if we run out of some of these colors. Part of the goal is to have some randomness and layered to it. And so one thing I could also do at some point is just pour more dye on top, but I love doing these little things where we end up with some more just random placement and spread. It feels, even though I'm not literally finger painting, it feels a lot like that. And I don't know, I just really enjoy that. Uh, so that was the end of the sea spray, pretty much. There's like a tiny bit of liquid down there. So what I'm gonna do here, as I mentioned, is I'm gonna pop some liquid in and just pour that on. I am a bit curious how things are doing. I do see, okay, there are some blues and maybe some more greens present. Um, but now by sort of pressing and letting some of these colors move, this is also going to soften uh, these differences a bit. Uh, and so it's really up to you how much you weight versus uh, add. But the goal 
is to have these little shifts be on the subtler side with just tapping it is doing. But we are definitely going to be adding more color to the other side at some point. It looks really, really dark. We need to also remember that things um, dry lighter than what you expect. And I do see some of that twist with black uh, in areas uh, as well. So uh, I am going to set a timer for 10 minutes and then we'll come and check in and probably flip. Okay, let's flip the yarn. Oh, I didn't check it with a spoon first, but I think that that is okay. I'm not super worried, but you can see we have excellent color penetration to the other side. Um, and actually we could even potentially move where the zip tie is. Uh, I don't know how necessary that is. So we see a ton of spread with that green. The pink, however, is striking a little bit faster. So I'm not going to use any more of our radioactive dye, but I am going to come in and add some pops of pink in various areas. Um, and now versus doing lines, I'm really just, you can see, adding it in different small spots. I do want this region to be more under water. And now we really are just going to spread some of these colors a bit more. Coming in with our gloopy sapphire, <laughs> gloopy, uh, that doesn't make a ton of sense as a word, and layer it on. Um, you could do more pouring, but what I like about using these eyedroppers or even coming in with these squeeze bottles is that it's allowing us to apply the dye to really small regions here on the yarn, which in turn allows us to get small changes in color. But now I am going to go add some water to this bottle okay, and pour it on, focusing a bit more on either end. Uh, I will likely be moving the yarn one more time uh, at some point just to make sure, this is that indigo, this is one of the best squeeze bottles I think that I have, but I will be coming in and moving one more time, although it is kind of coming out the side as well, so I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm being like, oh, this is a great squeeze bottle, as it like makes a mess all over my hands. Uh, <laughs> but I do think that I want to be careful as I add more color in here. Um, I want to make sure uh, that we have some decent coverage and spread. I will want to be very careful as we move our yarn just because we do, uh, <laughs> the navy continues to go. Uh, I want to be careful because it is non-superwash and we don't want to felt it, but we do want more uh, I do want to make sure that I have covered up as much of the pastel areas as possible. Actually, one thing we may do um, near the end is take, there's not very much navy left, we may take that to apply uh, to our yarn in various spots. But now, one of the things I'm going to do to help a bit is again come and gently press. And this is taking various blues. We have a lot of different blues in here, spreading it out a little bit, um, and also potentially helping it move through areas that were more pastel. And the nice thing about this metal spoon is that it's not gonna, even as we press, it's not gonna really agitate that fiber because uh, it is so smooth. So. Uh, and actually, I want to bring that blue down, but oof, I'm really liking where this is going. You can see 
think on camera it is feeling more subtle, but looking at it, I see some purple and teal uh, sections in here that I think are so, so pretty. But I'm also excited because I haven't tried to do something that feels more saturated on this twist base yet. So I do still, and things are still wet, I do see the twist come through here, but I'm really excited to see how it might look uh, when it's done. But anyway, I'm gonna set a timer for 10 minutes and then we'll come back. I am so happy, I am so happy. Okay, let's check the inside and just see. Um, checking around that zip tie and yeah, around the edge, we do see some areas that have a little bit less color. I'm not seeing anything that feels oh, super white, uh, but there are some more pastel patches where I would like more color, and especially it looks like right here, um, there is a bit as well. Um, and so now let's just add a bit more color. But I think I'm going to start by taking this remnant of navy, not much, and adding it with some water. Here are the bottle dregs, which really is just liquid now. Um, the color I have in a little cup. <laughs> and now I'm going to use this little fluted cup to pour this on. Since there are so many other colors in here, uh, this is adding a subtle element. It is less pigmented than a lot of the other colors that we have thus far. But now I'm coming with some more of the sapphire blue, which has more pigmentation, as we know, and layering this on in some regions where I feel like I may want a little bit more color. And yeah, I think that overall this is all really, really nice and good. Yeah, the sapphire blue is definitely not a color. I recommend that you make a huge uh, dye stock with just because it doesn't stay in solution super well, which means that for like consistency and stuff, it's hard to say exactly uh, what color it is and what color you have. But we've almost used up all of this little bit. All right, there are some dregs in here. I would like to rinse this out and we'll see how much color it looks like we have. Okay, I really hope I don't regret this. Um, but it is no longer that pigmented. There is like a fair amount of blue in here, but I am spreading it out very much all over. Uh, again, I don't hope that I, I hope that I don't really regret this and that it doesn't, it's not something that will cause bleeding. Um, I am just sort of moving the yarn a little bit, uh, to get that little bit of coverage, but that will soften everything and add a little bit more pigmentation to some of the light patches. So now I am going to, I guess, heat everything for 20 minutes and let's go chat while we wait. This is something I've chatted a little bit about before, but when I'm filming a video and trying to decide if it's gonna be a Dye Pot Weekly episode or something that is leave no dye behind, it comes down to the intent as I am starting a project. And today I knew I wanted to do a mostly blue, different hues with maybe a little bit more teal and a little bit more purpley hints. And when I was going and looking at the dye stocks I had in my collection, I had a lot of blues that were nearly empty. And so immediately I was like, ooh, that could be a really, really fun place to start. And so I happened to have things that were nearly empty that met the vision that I had in my head of the colorway I wanted to create. And so that's why it's more of a dye pot weekly because if I didn't have these pre-mixed blues, I would have gone and pulled a few blues and mixed up some liquid stocks to use for this project. The line is very narrow. Sometimes things could fit in either category.
category really, really easily. But in a lot of times, uh, Leave No Die Behind, I often don't know what colors I'm using because sometimes I have unlabeled leftovers from various projects and then I forget what it was. So uh, this is something that it would be easier for me to try to recreate because I know all of the different colors that I had. But anyway, I cannot wait to see this dry. All right, let's see how we are doing. There is very, very little color left. Uh, maybe not that little. There's, we still got some blues in here. Oof, when I flip, I see some more of the red. This is very, very pretty. Okay, what I want to do is add some more vinegar. So one, two, three, four, five tablespoons of vinegar. I'm going to just distribute it through the pan. And now I'm actually going to turn off the heat and leave the yarn in here to cool off. There's a chance that there could be some blues that didn't dissolve. I saw little particulates left, but by leaving the yarn in here to cool, it'll be in here for a couple of hours at least, uh, and that will allow the rest of those colors to slowly absorb or not, but extra heat won't hurt. And letting it cool slowly and gently will help protect uh, the fibers from felting. So once it's cool, then we can go wash the yarn. I did come and check on the yarn at one point. Um, oh, it is so pretty. The little hints of green, ooh, and the purple is so subtle that, okay, you can't really see on camera, but our dye bath is clear. The yarn is cool, and so now we can go wash it. That was why the white balance wasn't quite right. I still see the, some of the marled sections uh, in here where you have the black and what was more white. Oh, it is so cool. And I think it's gonna just be like a fun, like surprise element as you're knitting this because it wasn't the whole yarn. It's just sort of randomly in there. I want to be careful as I am washing this because it is non superwash. I'm seeing a little bit of some blue come out, which honestly is something that is expected, or not expected, but I'm not surprised by, just because of what that sapphire blue was doing. Um, but now I'm taking some clear dish soap I did also notice that just like that pre-soak was a little bit cloudy, I'm seeing a little a bit of that uh, here as well as we rinse the yarn. Now that this is completely full of water, I am, there's like a hint. It's not that bad, but I'm gonna let this soak for a tiny bit. Um, before we start rinsing it. I figure let's just do this slowly and carefully. I didn't set a timer or anything. I just figured that I'd wait a moment, then gently dip and raise to see how we're doing. So I wanna be careful with squeezing the yarn and be very gentle. And that is some bleeding. It is some bleeding, but hopefully, hopefully it'll resolve. So I'm gonna fill this back up. Notice that I'm not running the water directly on top of the yarn. There we go. Oh, wow. That's already like way, way better. Way better. Yeah, I'm seeing like a lot less. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and wear once again. I'm gonna just soak. We're gonna do this nice and slow. Soak, let time for things to come out, and I'll wander back over in a minute or two. Okay, this is why slow and steady is important because we got some more color out. Now, I always rinse my yarn to clear, but sometimes it is possible 
that even with rinsing the yarn, declare that bleeding can occur um, based on the different water chemistry that you can have. Uh, I am, I'm anticipating that this won't be a huge problem, that I'll be able to get it clear. But if you do experience bleeding in commercial or hand-dyed yarn when you start blocking something, add some vinegar to that soap and that can often stop it. Ugh, I do hate cleaning out. It is not my favorite. So I'm gonna go ahead and rinse this more off camera and I'll pop back in once the dye bath is clear. And with any luck, whenever I say that, then usually the next one, things are a lot better. <laughs> All right, it has been a couple of rinses later and we are looking very, very clear. So I'm now gonna go put this through my spin dryer and then we'll hang it up to dry. This yarn is so gorgeous. I love this watercolor soft feel that we have to where we added these different colors on. And you see small patches of color, but they sort of softly transition into one another, which is gorgeous and fun. And the black of the zebra still shows up really well. If we zoom in, then you still see these black plies, which will give another level of dimension and interest to this colorway. And it's just so rich. And the zebra yarn is so much fun. And they have at least three different types of bases of this. They have this non-superwash yarn. They have, I believe, a merino nylon blend and just a superwash merino, I think. And that's just so much fun out there to play with. <laughs> Micah, thank you so much for being my lab partner for this episode of Dye Pot Weekly. I really hope that you enjoy your yarn. I feel like this type of colorway could be a really wonderful combination of creating some hand spun yarn followed by dyeing it. Uh, if you don't want to go and buy a zebra base, for example, uh, you could spin something pretty similar. If you have a white ply and then a variegated white, black, and gray darker ply that you spin together, and then you could over dye it. And usually I'm very much in the, I want to, I prefer to dye my fiber before I spin it camp. But I'm enjoying these zebra yarn bases enough that I think it would be really fun to spin a variegated black and white ply, ply it with a white ply, and then dye that afterwards. So if that sounds like a fun dyeing, spinning, and then dyeing again series, let me know down in the comments below. I am just feeling very inspired. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and please make sure you are subscribed to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel, press that like button, and turn on notifications so you never miss a new video. I always post new videos every Tuesday and Friday mornings, plus we have live streams, unboxings, and other fun content along the way. And if you love the yarn I dye, go check out the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop for beautiful hand-dyed yarn featured in my videos. Thank you so much for watching.